you know, the the book is n not an entirely new book. Um, it is just a, a new edition, uh, enlarged enlarged edition. Uh, but I'm sure uh, most uh, most people have not seen the book before. Um, went out of print many years ago, and uh, thanks to uh, Doug French and Diana Forbush and the Mises Institute, it just has been reissued. Um, I just want to uh, say a few words about uh, one of the central themes of uh, of the book, and then make a few remarks about um, some of the um, extensions of uh, of that central theme. Um, economics was once part of what is called a moral science, um, and in this uh, moral science, uh, the concept of property uh, was a very important uh, concept. Um, during the stage of uh, economics being part of uh, moral science, uh, economics and ethics was in a way mixed up, um, and in the meantime, the concept of uh, property has almost entirely disappeared from uh, the discipline of, uh, of economics. Uh, but you can still recognize, of course, that uh, implicitly um, the concept still uh, plays an important role. For instance, we could not talk about exchange without having some idea of, um, uh, of property uh, or what is a voluntary exchange that requires us in a way to think about property also. Even uh, concepts like prices, um, uh, exchange ratios uh, between different property owners exchanging their, pr uh, their property and so forth. Um, but as a result of uh, economics becoming uh, what is called a value-free science, um, uh, ethics has uh, more and uh, more disappeared from uh, the discourse uh, among uh, economists. Um, and um, despite the fact that uh, even in order to speak about value-free uh, science, uh, we must also presuppose certain values, namely uh, respect for reason, uh, respect for uh, argumentation, the force of arguments, uh, and so forth. Um, in Mises, you find very little um, uh, talk about um, uh, property, especially in his uh, economic works. You find much more uh, talk about property in, uh, in Murray Rothbard. And my, my book has uh, set itself the task, so to speak, to, um, to reintegrate um, economics and ethics um, without, however, um, disputing or um, changing the fact that there is a clear-cut distinction between uh, a value-free positive economics on the one hand and uh, ethics as a normative discipline um, on, uh, on the other hand. Um, and um, uh, I do this uh, reintegrating of economics and ethics um, in purely theoretical pieces and also in a number of uh, applied pieces. What I want to do here in a few minutes is just um, to say a few words about my uh, writings in the book on, um, on pure ethics, uh, and uh, then uh, end with a few remarks about uh, applications. Um, what I try to accomplish in the book is to present some um, axiomatic foundation of ethics in the same way as Mises presents an axiomatic uh, foundation of economics. Uh, most of you are familiar with Mises' work um, where he begins his economics with the so-called uh, um, axiom uh, or um, axiom of uh, action. Um, and uh, this axiom of action uh, is axiomatic because you cannot uh, not act. Whenever you try to refute uh, that humans act, uh, you have to engage yourself in an uh, activity, and so we have, so to speak, a f firmly established starting point from which all of economic theory is derived. And uh, what I do in the book is uh, to show we have, in ethics, we have a very similar axiomatic starting point, which is called uh, the axiom of uh, argumentation, or also the a priori of argumentation. 
um, we cannot uh, deny that we can argue, um, engage in a discussion with each other, because if we would deny this, then we would already be engaged precisely in, uh, in argumentation. So we have a firmly established starting point, a starting point that cannot possibly be denied as being a starting point be beyond which you cannot possibly uh, go. Um, and um, once we have the starting point of we have to argue with each other, um, uh, it follows that uh, no statement, no proposition um, that, um, um, that denies this uh, starting point can possibly be defended. Uh, or we can also say that whatever must be taken for granted insofar as we engage in discussions with, with each other, um, cannot again be disputed uh, in terms of its validity because uh, if we would dispute it then we are engaged in what is called a performative contradiction. Uh, the content of our statement would be contradicted by the very fact of making this, uh, uh, making this statement. Um, and th the second thing I do is to de delineate what the task of ethics uh, is. Um, the task of ethics is uh, conflict uh, avoidance or peaceful um, uh, cooperation um, and we are um, um, uh, confronted with the possibility of conflicts because there exists uh, scarcity and in order to solve the problem of how can we avoid conflicts uh, uh, given the fact of uh, scarcity, we obvious, it is obviously required that we must have exclusivity rules or rules of property that assign the right to control scarce resources to one person rather than uh, uh, to another. Um, so scarcity is one of the requirements or one of the, um, one of the requirements of having ethical problems and the other um, uh, requirement for having ethical problems is the fact that we must have rational entities being involved in, uh, in conflicts, uh, uh, entities that can argue and discuss uh, with each other. A further requirement for any type of ethics is it must be um, uh, a discipline that formulates rules which are universalizable, that is to say all people all arguers must be capable in principle of agreeing to these rules and uh, uh, a further requirement for any type of ethics is we must formulate rules that allow us to act from the very beginning of mankind on. Uh, 